Welcome to Reading for Your Life. I'm Alex, a guy who loves reading and who's always trying to be a little better. This month, I want to share Sarah Wilson's First We Make the Beast Beautiful. Let's get into it. I don't really remember how I found this book, which may explain why I came into it with mixed expectations. The book's subtitle, A New Journey Through Anxiety, is probably what landed it on my radar. But even before the book begins, the author discloses that she's not a medical professional, which neither am I, and this book is a creative response to her experience of anxiety in her own life. She also describes the book as nomadic in nature, and having read the book, I encourage everyone to take those two topics to heart before you dive in. This is not a nonfiction treatise on the condition, treatment, or even experience of anxiety written by a researcher, nor is it entirely a coherent narrative describing the author's personal journey. Between the covers, you're taken on a somewhat meandering journey back and forth between both of those possibilities with a couple of additional detours thrown in for good measure. And the author tells us over the course of the book exactly why it feels that way. The contents were written longhand, piecemeal, on the backs of napkins, menus, and other stray pieces of paper that just happened to be in reach. So in some ways, the book is a jigsaw puzzle of several years of hard work and sudden thoughts that were fitted together. That brings a certain abruptness to the book that you should be prepared for. Now, before we go any further, let's take a second and talk about what we mean by anxiety. Anxiety can mean a lot of different things, so a few definitions will help us here. Everyone gets stressed and experiences acute anxiety. That is, worry over specific things in a limited time frame. We all have stress from work or school or family or money from time to time. I remember going for a hike in Arizona. We were crossing this boulder field in the middle of the desert, and suddenly we heard a rattlesnake. Now, I had some very sudden and very useful acute anxiety in that moment. But when stress and anxiety become chronic, that is... They don't go away when the object of worry is removed, or the cycle of anxiety kicks in without a real cause in the first place, you get into the realm of anxiety disorders. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America recognizes a ton of different manifestations of anxiety, including social anxiety, panic disorders, phobias, PTSD, and something called generalized stress disorder. If you listen to people describe the sensations of anxiety, you hear things like the feeling that all eyes in the room are looking at you, judging you, or an inability to imagine a positive future. Muscle tension, racing hearts, cold sweats, rapid breathing. When anxiety starts to impact the way you live your life, maybe keeping you up at night or increasing your irritability, it's characterized as a disorder. That could mean outright panic responses or proactively avoiding certain social situations. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, affecting more than 40 million people, or about 18% of all adults in the U.S. But only about a third of those people seek treatment. And this is where the long-term health consequences come in. People with anxiety are three to five times more likely to go to a doctor and six times more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders than people who don't suffer from anxiety disorders. If it keeps happening, chronic anxiety can cause immune issues, digestive sleep and reproductive problems, headaches, stomach aches, anger. It can make colds and flus worse. Chronic anxiety can cause heart disease, high blood pressure, and even diabetes. A further complication is that a lot of people don't experience anxiety in isolation. Anxiety and depression often co-occur, for instance. Our author, Sarah Wilson's experience of anxiety, is multifaceted like that. She doesn't have anxiety as an acute experience. Her anxiety is rolled up with a host of other major life complications, including OCD, struggles with depression, physical ailments, and career and personal ups and downs. So let's talk a little bit more about her story before we get into the weeds on anxiety. Sarah's anxiety is a major driver for her life. She attempts escape from her normal life multiple times, disappearing to remote places to reduce distractions or uprooting and basically pushing a hard reset button on her life. She's more than just an author or a journalist. She's been editor of Australian Cosmopolitan, a television host on MasterChef Australia, and she created a movement with her I Quit Sugar blog, which spiraled into cookbooks and media appearances before she walked away from it all in early 2018 for philosophical reasons. You will stumble through a bit of Under the Tuscan Sun or Eat, Pray, Love in this book, too. I think the best way to describe the author is as a seeker, both of knowledge and experience. In this book, her other writings, and any of her public talks, 
you're going to hear the word research a lot. As someone who also over-researches, I totally get it. That compulsion to understand so that one can control can be fueled by anxiety. But the author also couples that drive with a willingness to drop everything and go experience anything just in case it works. Over the course of the book, we're taken to a yoga retreat in India, a writing project in New York, a secluded shack near the beach, and a Hare Krishna commune. Interwoven with this very personal story is a lot of information about anxiety, pulled from every corner of the world, from Plato to Eckhart Tolle to Oprah's personal life coach, who can apparently bend spoons with her mind. Again, I get the feeling that Sarah Wilson will take just about any advice that moves the needle, which is something that I try to practice in my own life too. But let me be real here. This book wasn't my thing at first. I hit the halfway point of the book, and I honestly just, I wasn't feeling it. I set the book aside for a few days with plans to come back to it eventually, but the next few days were some of the least anxious days that I'd had in months. When I came back to the book, there were a couple of things that I realized I hadn't realized were happening as I read. The book absolutely helped me put a name to my own anxiety, and in naming it, I was able to realize when I was feeling anxious and then do something about it. More about some of those strategies for dealing with anxiety in a little bit, but let's start back at the beginning. Why do we feel anxious in the first place? I want to quote a story from the book that puts it in more mythic terms. In Plato's Protagoras, twin brothers Prometheus and Epimetheus are charged with the rather large gig of creation. They're told to set the world up so that every species has a quality or gift that keeps them safe, such that the entire kingdom can exist in balance. Birds get feathers so they can fly from harm, deer are blessed with speed, and cockroaches get cunning. All is created with sustainability and fairness in mind, but Epimetheus arrives at humans and realizes that he's run out of qualities in his sack of gifts. He has nothing to give man, no fur, no thick hide, no fangs, no great weight. Bugger. He turns to his brother Prometheus, the more insightful of the two. Prometheus suggests a makeshift solution. Humans will have to survive by being the inventors of their own nature. They'll have to improvise, inventing their own furs and manufacturing contraptions with speed. And then they'll have to remain restless. You see, while we're incomplete and restlessly aware of the very fact that something's missing, it will keep us forever striving forward, making fur substitutes and contraptions, and thus secure. To make it more scientific, anxiety puts your threat system on high alert. You remember my story about the rattlesnake? High alert was a good place for me to be. It kept me safe. In short doses... Threat activation can heighten your system, and a shot of adrenaline puts you in fight-or-flight mode, which can help you perform in all sorts of ways. There's an old trick among public speakers and stage actors that says stage fright and excitement about going on aren't really that far apart. Tell yourself that your nerves are just excitement, and you can funnel that nervous energy into a better performance. It's pretty easy to think about where that anxiety came from. Imagine the African savanna. A group of our ancestors make their way slowly through the tall grass. On one side of the group is Grog. He's preternaturally relaxed. He's looking down at the ground, hoping for a nice grub. On the other side of the group is Groog. Groog is anxious. Crossing the open field always makes him nervous. There's no cover, and he knows that the big predators like to hide in the tall grasses. So he's alert. He moves slowly. His eyes are wide. He's listening for any noises. And then a twig cracks that gives away the location of the large animal that's been stalking the group for the last few minutes. Groog reacts. Grog is still looking for his grub. So for better or worse, we're the product of the ancestors that survived. There are entire lanes of evolutionary possibility that we'll never know because the ancestors best suited to survive their own times are the ones that pass along their genes. Sometimes that means that our brains aren't as suited for the modern world as we would like. Some anxiety disorders, like generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorders, are more inheritable. Others can be driven by traumatic experience or even brain chemistry. But whatever the cause, our brain has the pathways and tendencies to experience anxiety. We just have a few different triggers that can take us there. But once that anxiety engine starts to fire, sometimes it's hard to shut it off. My favorite metaphor for thinking about why all this happens is called the triune mind. Side note, there's a Buddhist principle also called the triune mind, but that's not what we're talking about. John Price gives a good description in The Triune Mind and a Triune Brain, published in Dialogues in Clinical Neuroscience. Imagine all our evolutionary ancestors. At the most basic level, we all share the same basic animalistic drives, essentially to survive and reproduce. Let's call that primal driver the reptilian brain. After some time goes by, some of our ancestors start to develop new brain functions beyond just survival. 
Now there was brain function to regulate social hierarchy. We'll call this part of the brain paleomammalian. More time goes by, and like a bolt of lightning, man finds reason. Now that all sounds well and good, but don't forget that each of those brains has its own job to do, and the goals may not overlap. A good way to think about it is a cart being pulled by a horse. There may be a perfectly reasonable driver with some limited control over the horse, and since the horse is strapped to the cart, the horse has limited control over the cart. But if something spooks the horse, the driver can lose control pretty quick, and a large enough rut in the road could put the cart into the ditch, even if the horse is still plodding along. Now, neuroscientists using brain imaging have decided that this model probably isn't literally true. Too much of your brain lights up during almost any decision for there to be completely isolated parts of your brain. But there are plenty of reasons that processes like fear responses, social relationship regulation, and your higher reason wouldn't sync up. Think of gut reactions and subconscious social cues. Your brain can pick up on things without making the logical part of your brain slow down to take stock. But then what happens when those systems take off on their own and leave your conscious brain behind? When that happens, it can feel like your trained mind isn't communicating. It may feel like the reptilian brain is in full-on fight-or-flight mode, or the paleomammalian brain is paralyzed with the fear of being socially isolated, and then your logical brain is just along for the ride. And unfortunately, it seems like there's a lot for us to feel anxious about today. The American Psychological Association published a report in 2018 called Stress in America. They found that stress and anxiety were rising in nearly every age group. A Harris poll found rising levels among teenagers caused by events like gun violence, family separation, and a high-profile sexual assault. Young adults are now the most likely to report poor mental health issues of all kinds, including anxiety. Adults report stress over work, health issues, and money. 45% of Americans reported that they lay awake at night due to stress. 37% report stress eating, either by choosing unhealthy food or simply overeating. Nearly 70% said that the nation's future causes them significant stress. So with all of this going on, what are we supposed to do? Okay, let's jump back to the book, because I really did find that this book helped me with my own anxiety. One huge way is that Sarah gives you permission to feel anxious. It's not bad or some kind of moral weakness. In fact, anxiety is deeply human. Anxiety stems from our primal brains reacting to the world around us. It's the same wiring that kept your ancestors alive. So if anxiety is a problem, it's not that the hamster gets on the wheel, it's that the stupid hamster won't get off the wheel. Anxiety is fine if we can keep the alarm bells from ringing when there's no danger. Second, anxiety isn't always a bad thing. Sarah hits a point near and dear to my heart. You can't always be chill and happy. I know Instagram makes it look like you can, but that life would be miserable. There's a reason that stories like The Most Dangerous Game or Fight Club have resonated, We need challenge in our lives. The soma-medicated masses in Brave New World are presented as a dystopia, not an ideal. So if calm and happy is an occasional state, something that we work towards and that serves as a reward for the hard work well done, then sometimes we'll feel stressed and anxious. It's our brains worrying that we're falling behind. If we can understand it as a driving force, keep it from consuming us, and maybe better position it as excitement about the challenge, anxiety can actually be a good thing. In no small way evidenced by the long list of great thinkers and doers who have publicly described their anxiety. People like Oprah, Stephen Colbert, Adele, and Kristen Bell have all talked about anxiety in interviews. Or take it back in time. Tolstoy, Hemingway, Churchill, Lincoln, and Van Gogh all talked about fighting severe bouts of anxiety at some point in their lives. That's some good company to be in. Once we've done the work of accepting that we're sometimes anxious and allowing ourselves to feel that way, we just have to remain mindful. That is to say, being aware of the moment and your reaction to it. Dealing with anxiety is similar to how I deal with spiders. I'm fine if I see it coming. It's only when it sneaks up on me that we have a real problem. Recognizing the situations that cause you anxiety and then understanding your own physical and mental responses can help you step out of that moment when anxiety hits. You can look at the anxious response as a thing itself, name it, and examine why it's happening. Being able to step out of that moment to view an emotional response like that can be incredibly powerful and help you diffuse its impact. Research has shown the same thing happens with a host of other emotional responses, including anger and depression. If you can put your finger on it, you can start to change your response to it. Sarah gives us a list of response tactics, including deep breathing, meditation, 
forcing a smile, writing, more on some of those in a second. Because at an even more basic level, there's a ton of research that suggests that an overall healthy lifestyle can help reduce anxiety. A study in the journal Life Sciences in 2007 found that rats with diets high in fat and sugar were more likely to be obese, develop chemical changes in their brains, and exhibit anxious behavior. And get this, my favorite part of the study, the high-fat, high-sugar diets that the rats were eating was called a highly palatable diet, which makes me think about my dinner choices a little more carefully. An article in the journal Neuroscience found that rats weaned from mothers who'd consumed high-fat diets, again, had chemical changes in the brain, but also experienced an altered inflammatory response and, of course, higher anxiety levels. The Scandinavians have found that gluten-free diets can help reduce anxiety for people with celiacs, and there's research suggesting that healthy gut bacteria can help reduce anxiety and depression too. So unsurprisingly, eat better, feel better. I know that's kind of hard for me to accept too. Another somewhat unsurprising factor is activity. A study by McDowell, Dishman, Gordon, and Herring in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine in 2018 conducted a systematic meta-analysis of 24 long-term studies of over 80,000 individuals, and they found exactly what you'd think. And I quote, engaging in physical activity protects against anxiety symptoms and disorders. Some of the same authors published another longitudinal study in the International Journal of Epidemiology in 2018, which found that among 4,000 individuals over 50, higher physical activity levels led to dramatic drops in generalized anxiety disorder. What about sleep? Yep, sleep matters too. And it's a double-edged sword. Anxiety can often cause sleeplessness, but sleep disorders can be a driving factor to make anxiety worse. So on the whole, living a healthier life helps prevent anxiety disorders. Eat better, exercise, and make sure you're getting enough sleep. But of course, there's so much more to it than that. Environmental factors, brain chemistry, or even a genetic proclivity can all help cause anxiety, no matter how much kale you eat. That's why, in my mind, the most important way to address anxiety is something Sarah Wilson hits on, mindfulness. Being aware of yourself in the moment and taking stock of how you're feeling can help you identify when you're feeling anxious, and naming the problem is the first step to fixing it. For me, admitting that I, at least sometimes, am an anxious person, and that when I'm anxious, I feel or react in a certain way, was a really powerful thing. Now, when I find myself feeling anxious, I don't push against it. I don't feel anxious about being anxious, which can set off a spiral of negative feelings. Instead, I can initiate tactics to help diffuse the anxiety and then find my way out. Here's a few things you can try. Number one, relax. And I mean that physically. Think about how you're sitting and holding your body right now. Are your shoulders tense? Relax them. Relax your jaw. Unfurrow your brow. If you're anything like me, you just realized that you were doing all of those things unconsciously. Set reminders for yourself to physically relax your body. And when you start to feel anxiety setting in, try to pick apart the physical reactions body part by body part. Number two, breathe. I know, another stupid one, right? But get this, your breathing can signal your body on how it should react. Your body has an automatic response to fast, shallow breathing. That's the sign that you're engaged in something physical, ready to fight or flee. Stress and anxiety can trigger rapid breathing as your body sends all the triggers of imminent danger. But you can start to short-circuit that process with resonant breathing. An article in the New York Times called Breathe, Exhale, Repeat, The Benefits of Controlled Breathing, quotes Dr. Patricia Gerbert, Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychology at New York Medical College and co-author of The Healing Power of Breath. She says, if you breathe correctly, your mind will calm down. Dr. Chris Streeter, an associate professor of psychiatry and neurology at Boston University, has published a number of studies looking at yoga and controlled breathing as a treatment for depression, anxiety, and even suicidal ideation. In some cases, the reduction in depression was on par with taking antidepressants. And it's so easy to get started. In fact, let's give it a shot. Wherever you are, let's breathe together for just a minute. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Slow inhalation to the count of five, then exhale for five. Ready? Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale.
How do you feel? The experts recommend regular breathing sessions for 15 to 20 minutes at a time, but even a few breaths are usually enough to start to see some benefit. I was once in a safety seminar about what to do in an active shooter situation. The expert leading the seminar said that the first thing to be prepared for is that you're going to be panicking and unable to make decisions. His number one piece of advice was to take three slow, deep breaths before trying to do anything else. Even in crisis situations, that can help calm the panic response, get oxygen to your brain, and put you back in control of your actions. Okay, number three, write things down. They all sound so easy, don't they? But for real, a pen and paper can help combat anxiety in a few really important ways. Journaling can be a huge help on the mindfulness and self-examination front. Even a simple mood journal, that is like jotting down how you feel at a given point of the day, every day, can help pinpoint moments of anxiety and potentially help root out causes. Keeping a regular journal can also help you explore some of the scripts that push you into anxiety. Try something as simple as writing down, right now I feel blank, because. Sometimes as short a prompt as that can help unlock thoughts and emotions that are hard to get at through more direct means. Another important reason to write things down is to give your brain a rest. I'm not a list person. I mean, at all. I find schedules and to-do lists incredibly confining, but I also have a tendency to get extremely anxious when there are just too many irons in the fire at once. What if I miss something? What if I get behind and never catch up? Find a fresh piece of paper and just purge all those items from your head. Then pick an item that you know you can accomplish, do it, and cross that sucker off. Again, I'm not a list person, but even I'll be the first to admit that it feels really good to cross something off that list. In fact, stay tuned in the future when we look at Atul Gawande's checklist manifesto. And before you go, one last very important way to deal with anxiety. Talk to someone. Especially if you've tried all that other stuff and it's not getting better, or even more so if you're too anxious to try any of the other things. Anxiety is one of the most common struggles in the U.S. today, and it's incredibly treatable with the right tools and help. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America has a great resource for finding a therapist near you, and even a list of therapists that provide telemental services in every state. I've linked to their page in the show notes, or you can go to them directly at adaa.org slash finding dash help. In the end, I was really surprised by this book. Turning the last page, I finally realized why I almost gave up halfway through. This book reads like anxiety feels. The sudden abrupt transitions and interweaving between personal narrative and carefully constructed research should feel familiar to anyone whose anxious brain has kept them awake at night. I can admit to waking up at 2 a.m. with a brain that just won't turn off, Some imagined personal slight gets stuck on repeat, or a concern about work gets lodged in my brain like a thorn, and no matter how much you toss and turn, it just won't stop. So I get out of bed at 2 a.m. and I do something about it. I catch up on the work project where I write down things that I'm grateful for. The hamster gets off the wheel, and I can go back to sleep. Sarah Wilson understands anxiety, having lived with it for years. And this book gives perspective on the beast from both inside and out. The Chinese proverb that serves as the book's title, First We Make the Beast Beautiful, tells us that to deal with something, one must know it intimately. To understand what makes something different or unique is to see its beauty. In this book, Sarah helps us understand anxiety that we might deal with it better. I hope you've enjoyed this month's episode of Reading for Your Life. In December, I'll wrap up the calendar year with Randy Pausch's last lecture. It's one of my favorite books, and I can't wait to share it. In the coldest, darkest time of the year, It's an incredible reminder of what matters most. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast or drop me a line on social media at Alex P. Acton on Instagram and Twitter. Tell me what you think of the show, your strategies for dealing with anxiety, or recommend a book that's taught you important life lessons. You can also keep up with future shows at Modern Polymaths on Twitter and Modern Polymaths Media on Facebook. Until next month, thanks for listening. Keep reading, and I wish you the best life imaginable.